So, if you take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as they go down, 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament. Uh, you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then you get 1 and 2 Corinthians. If you get to 2 Corinthians, just go back. You're right there. And today we're going to hit rapidly, and I know that you don't believe that, because what's it mean when a preacher puts his watch on the pulpit? Nothing. Um, but we're going we're gonna to touch on some important ideas for us as a church, because we're going to talk about how we learn things and how God speaks to us. And we actually get all three of them in the service today. The first that you that you get, we actually already sang about, and that is when we sang, He lives. What's the, the chorus on that goes what? He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how he how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. As Christians, one of the ways that we know Jesus is alive and the ways that we know God and the way, one of the ways that we encounter and experience what God is doing is through our own experience, which is what that, that, that verse, that chorus is. We know he lives because he lives within my heart. We, we have experienced, we know what it is to serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. We have experienced that. We see that. We see God change our lives. We see the fruit of the Spirit growing in our hearts. We see that we act differently, that we love our enemies more so than we would without Jesus. Maybe not enough, but more so than we would without Jesus. And so that's one way in which we learn and understand things is through our own experience. And after all, experience is a good teacher. I would side with, with one of my favorite authors uh, whose statement was that experience is not the best teacher. Other people's experience is the best teacher. Um, don't, you, you don't want to learn from your own mistakes. You want to learn from other people's mistakes. You make fewer mistakes that way or you make different mistakes that way. Um, this is why, this is one reason why you should read biographies and read history. You want to learn from what other people have, have been through. If somebody else has already accumulated wisdom, why would you set it aside? And so we see that value. We see that. We sing of that. But we also know this, our own experience is not necessarily the best understanding because it's always shaded a little bit by what goes on. Yesterday, we're driving back from, from Arkadelphia, uh, and in case y'all have never made the drive from Crossit to Arkadelphia, Arkansas, there's something you should know about it. There are no straight roads between Crossit and Arkadelphia. Not, and, and I don't mean that well, you, you don't just pick up, I mean, you pick up Highway 8, you stay on Highway 8 pretty much the whole time. That's not what I mean. Um, with the exception of the bridge over the Washita River right there at Arkadelphia, that's the longest period of straight that the road experiences between here and there. <laughs> might be an exaggeration, but it's, it's close, <laughs> but that way. But you put four people in the car. And everybody experiences those curves a little differently. Depending on where in the car they're sitting. Everybody experiences those spots. There's those spots that there's this orange diamond sign over there that says bump or dip because they're trying to fix the road, or at least they want you to think they're trying to fix the road. <laughs> Depending on where you're sitting in the car, you experience that dip differently. There's even science and studies for this. It's actually it's got a fancy term called the Rashomon effect. 
from the, the person who initially did the, the studies on it. And it, it is the, the fact that five people can, can be an eyewitness to something and give slightly different accounts to what they saw happen. That our perspective colors how we understand our experience. Which is why, though we would hold tightly to and in fact encourage you to know what your personal testimony is of how you came to know Jesus and what God is doing in your life right now, and we would say that you can't really argue with that. We would say that actually there are a couple spots that we could argue because we could say that we know for certain there are certain things God does and doesn't do. And we know that actually from another song that we learned, most of us, if we were in church, we learned well before we learned he lives. It's one that we taught in the nursery. Jesus loves me. This I know. Why? Not because of our experience, not because somebody else told us, but because the Bible tells us. Because we have the Word of God to look at when we want to see and know what God has done. And so we reach into that and we grab a Bible verse that I didn't tell you to turn to, but it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we'll see all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so we see the value of the Word of God, that we learn about God through His Word. Because we can't really dispute, when you back up one chapter in there in 2 Timothy, if Paul tells Timothy, don't let people spend their time arguing about words and chasing after silly divisiveness. Take what's plain in the Word and stick with it. And we can either have a short sermon today, or we can spend all day recounting the times and possibly calling for testimony from y'all that have been in churches your whole life. The number of times that we've had disputes and arguments and difficulties within the church over people who said one of two things, either, well, I know that's what the Bible said, but I think this instead. Or who said, well, I think God said this, didn't he? And then you go, well, where is that in the Bible? And you go, uh, it's in there somewhere, and it's really not. Now, some portions of that aren't harmful. We pick up in American heritage several things from Benjamin Franklin that are not bad things to, to think, but they're not scriptural. For example, cleanliness is next to godliness. It's not a biblical truth. It's not a bad idea. If you've ever taken kids to youth camp, you would also know that cleanliness is next to impossible in certain situations. But cleanliness, you know, it, it's, it's good advice. There are other pieces of good advice that are out there that we tend to, uh, uh, well, it's got to be in Proverbs someplace. Well, it's actually not. Um, I've seen people quote several things from Shakespeare that, well, it's in the Proverbs. Like, no, it, it's not. That's Shakespeare. It's not bad. But it's not biblical. And it probably would have been fun to like have Tony build us a slideshow and be able to point out and go, all right, y'all tell me, is this Bible or is this not? I actually have a friend of mine, he has he has one that looking at the book of Lamentations, where the question is, is this Lamentations or is this a Taylor Swift lyric? Lamentations is actually happier most of the time. If you're ever in a church like conference and they're doing that. Is it, is it Lamentations or is it Taylor Swift? If it's see the happier one is Lamentations. What can I what can I say? That's what that's that's eh, I know it's trouble to walk in. But we uh, you know, there's there, there's there's that kind of thing where we take in other ideas. And they're not bad ideas. Sometimes they're even, you know, from songs that we sing in church. We'll sing, you know, we'll sing Amazing Grace and realize that it's biblically informed and it's it's right and it's truthful. But scripture never says Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's a song based off of scripture. So we want to make sure that we know the Bible, and that's crucial for us. 
The word of God is where he has spoken and given us what he has to say. And when God speaks, he does not make mistakes. Now, when I go to tell a story, I may have a tendency to emphasize certain parts or maybe exaggerate things for effect. I may say things like the only straight portion of the road from here to Arkadelphia is the bridge over the Washita River on Highway 7. And we all know down in that that's not entirely true. There's a bridge over the bayou, over Bartholomew Bayou, uh, right there going into Bradley County that's also straight. And it goes straight through New Edinburgh, which doesn't look anything like Scotland to me, but they say it, you know, it is. Um, you know, there, there's other straight spots, but I may exaggerate to, to make a point. But God doesn't do such things. He speaks plainly, He speaks clearly. And he doesn't make a mistake. I may try to. I may tell a story about something that we did, and then I may look over here, and, and y'all notice that you know I'll preach, and then I'll look at Anne. Especially if I'm telling a story, I'll look about something that's happened to us. I'll end up looking at Anne, and she may be sitting there going, <laughs> because I get a detail wrong. I mean, this morning somebody asked, you know, how things were going. I said, well, you know, we took we took Olivia yesterday to get her scheduled for school next year. It's like, wait, no, it wasn't Olivia. It's Angela. Olivia's the one that graduates from college next year. Angela graduates from high school this year. You know, I'm trying to roll the clock back and, you know, things get a little confused from time to time. We may make mistakes. We may remember details wrong. God never has that problem. He does not make mistakes. He does not get details wrong. He doesn't say one thing and mean another. He said, love your enemies. That wasn't, he didn't misspeak. One of the, you know, one of the interesting things that, that you see on the, on the internet is you'll see, see a meme and they'll, they'll, they'll do the classic artwork and it's got Jesus, at the, like he's teaching at the Sermon on the Mount and say, you know, love your enemies. You know, or, you know, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then the next one has somebody asking a question. Usually it's a question like, even if they voted for the other guy or even if they don't go to the same church, and then, the, then it gives Jesus giving the answer. Yes, even when they ask foolish questions. Or it, say, or it says, okay, let me back up. Let's go over this again and let me know where I lose you. When God has spoken, he speaks plainly. He speaks clearly. He speaks without error. He speaks without making a mistake. Now, we could now dive off into all sorts of questions. But what about this part of the Bible? What about that part of the Bible? What about the other part of the Bible? And that's what we have Wednesday nights for. So come eat dinner and ask questions with me. But I am on very, very firm ground with this. I could haul in about 40 books and stack them out across here. And I would do it, except that I had to take them back and put them back in my study, and I don't feel like it. And show you that from a historical and archaeological perspective, we have never found anything in the ground in the records of history that shows that the Bible is in error. Now, there have been there are spots in the Bible that we read something in the Bible and it's the only source we have for it happening. Do you know how common that is in the ancient world? It's incredibly common. We have one source for the existence, for the happening that we call the Trojan War. And yet, it gets taught in history as, as historical and accurate. Most of us are aware of terms like the Trojan Horse and that type of thing. In fact, if you have a computer, you should know what a Trojan Horse is because it's a reference to, it also gets applied now to the way people sneak stuff on your computer and mess you up. Okay? By the way, don't click on any email attachment from somebody that you don't know and they don't you don't know what it is. If it says attachment, well, I'm curious, what, don't click on it yet. If it says it's from a friend and you're not sure what they're sending you, call them and ask them before you open it up. That's not a sermon tip, that's just a life tip. If it claims to be from your bank and asks for your login information, don't put it in there. Pick up the phone. Call the number that you know is your bank's number and ask them. Why? Because people will do you. They'll scam you. Don't, don't fall into that. But, but we, we know these things and we hear about these things. So, so what if the Bible is the only source for it? 
Homer is the only source for the Trojan War. And yet, in the last 200 years, a guy went out and found archaeologically said, oh, we'll dig here. Found it. Every time folks have tried to put the Bible to the test, they have found no evidence that it's false. God speaks. He doesn't make a mistake. We may not like it. We may be confused by it. Just because we we don't uh, just because God doesn't make a mistake doesn't mean that we hear perfectly either, or that we understand perfectly. Yeah. People's ability to get it right is a separate discussion, but it's important that we realize that God speaks very, very plainly in his word and very, very truthfully that the standard of truth that, this, that, that as we Baptist, we say it in our confession of faith, if you've never read the Baptist faith and message, this is how we express it, and that is that the Bible contains truth without any mixture of error at all. If the Bible were a, were a thousand acre field planted entirely with corn, there wouldn't be a single weed to, to sprout. If it were a thousand acres of oak forest, there's not a single pine tree out there. No error, no mistake, no mistakes on God's part. Do we get it a little bit goofy at times? I think we have. Don't believe me? Call you in 20 history books and point you to places that people did get it wrong. That's why it's always our purpose as God's people to come back to the Word of God and say, Do we understand what God said here? And to ask ourselves that question. And so we know that God speaks through our own experience, through what we know in our heart, that we know He lives because He lives within our heart. We know his truth because the Bible tells us so. And then we know his truth because he gave us certain things to do to remember what he has done and to proclaim that truth going forward. And that is what we'll do here in a few moments as a church is one of those, and that is to observe the Lord's Supper. And this is where 1 Corinthians comes in. Beginning with verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have the witness of the Holy Spirit in our life that he lives. We have the testimony of the word of God that he lives. And then we have our practices that God has ordained for us, that God has set for us to remember and to proclaim to the world what he's done. One of them is baptism that we do, whereby we remember that Jesus died, was buried, and rose up on the third day, where we remind ourselves that as believers, we have died and been resurrected to walk in newness of life with Jesus. The other is this, as we come to the Lord's table, where we remember that his body was broken for us, that he went to the cross, having been flogged, having suffered all night, you know, he been kept awake all night, suffered abuses, was nailed to the cross, that his body would die, that he would die for us, that his blood was poured out, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so we have this time to remember that which was paid for our salvation and to proclaim to the world, whether it's our small world, 
It's often the first chance that parents get within the church to really explain the gospel to their children is when we talk about what's going on with the Lord's Supper. Whether it's to proclaim within the church that reminder that our sins are forgiven because Jesus gave all for us. And it's our proclamation to the world around that this is what we are. We are people who serve the God who died and lives again. We are people who serve the risen Savior who's in the world today with us as his hands and feet, with us as his body to serve him and to draw that world to him so that people would know that Jesus loves them. That they would hear us speak of his word plainly and truthfully. So we have three ways that God has given us to, to fully know him. That internal experience of the presence of the Spirit. The truthful word that has no errors within it. And the actions he's given us to be tangible, things that we can feel, things that we can touch, things that remind us. Here in a few moments as we take the Lord's Supper, we'll be reminded But as we come to it, of course, we've got to be reminded of the fact that this is important. Just as it is vital that we look to his word and don't manipulate God's word to make it say what we want it to say. And that we don't just lie about what we feel inside and about what our experiences are to try to get people to think that we're more holy or more spiritual than we are. So we want to do this in the right way. And so the apostle writes again in 1 Corinthians. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. Whoever drink, eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned before the world. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home or eat donuts in the fellowship hall, so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come. We want to take some time. And this is why instead of just labeling it uh, a, a time of, of invitation. We've actually got a label in the bulletin as a, as a time of commitment and, and, and a recognition of commitment. We want to make sure as we come to the table that we do so with our hearts fully committed. Our hearts fully committed that we as individuals will follow Jesus well to the best that we're able to. That we are doing so and that we have, have sought him and his grace and his forgiveness as we go forward. Yeah. That we're not walking individually in a sin of any kind of rebellion where we've told God, we know you said to do this, but we're going to do this instead. We know you commanded that we be that we be baptized in obedience to you, but I'm not going to do it because I just don't want to. Where you, where the Lord has said, well, you know, you should love your neighbor as yourself, but I've decided I just don't really like my neighbor, so I'm going to take the Lord's Supper anyway. Guess what? You should reevaluate that. And in the time of commitment, make a fresh commitment in your heart that you're going to walk in obedience to the Lord. And so there's that individual reflection that needs to happen, that individual commitment that I am going to do what I'm supposed to do in walking with Jesus. Second, it's a commitment to your neighbor. We as Americans are very used to this idea that you know, half of us today, when it comes time to eat, we'll pile in a car, run through a drive through grab a cheeseburger, and we won't even look at the people we're eating with because some of us will be cramming cheeseburgers down our throat as we weave through traffic. We miss 
miss the idea that meals indicate relationships. That if we sit together today to eat, to eat at the Lord's table, even though it's just a small thing, just a small reminder, that a part of that is our recommitment to our relationship one with another. That we are together as we do this. And so the first commitment is as individuals that we will follow Jesus to the fullest that we can. The second, that we will love one another to the fullest that we can. That we will be forgiving to one another, that we will show grace to one another. And the third is the action that all of us that come to the table together will look to the one who invited us. And that's not me, and that's not the deacons. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And say that together we will strive to honor our host. That together we will do what is necessary not only to bring no disrespect to his to him, but also to honor what he has commanded. Where he has said in other places to go out and to find and to bring in that his house will be full. To remind as we come, to be reminded as we come to this little foretaste of the future moment that we all sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb. To realize that it's on us to make sure there are no empty seats. to that as a body. And so individually we commit ourselves to our obedience to the Lord. We commit ourselves to our relationships with one another and together as the body of Christ we commit ourselves again and afresh to our obedience to Him. And so with that in mind we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll come to our time of response. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word and prayer that you'll help us honor you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As our music team comes back forward, as, as our worship, worship team comes back, what we're going to do is we're going to stand together and sing.